Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, this is Jean-Daniel Hostel, the president of the Java Cloud Forum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, fifth in a series of uh, webinars that we organize. And I hope you had the opportunity to enjoy the previous one. And if not, uh, you can still look for the replay on the Java Cloud Forum website. The Java Card Forum is an industry association driving the evolution of Java Card technology, a successful secure platform shipped by billions over more than 20 years. The latest Java Card 2.1 specification from Oracle, released a little less than two years ago, has exciting new features uh, with several of them uh, targeted towards the booming segment of the Internet of Things. In our previous webinars, we addressed the benefit of Java Card to the security of deployed IoT devices, as well as the post-issuance personalization. Today, uh, the webinar will focus on the onboarding of IoT devices and uh, how we can trust them, which is a key feature to attest the features and identity of the IoT devices. The presentation will be given by Patrick Van Haver and Nikolai Bohr. Patrick is a principal engineer in the Java Card Platform Group at Oracle and is specification lead for the Java Card Platform. Patrick has extensive experience in security and held multiple positions in engineering, product management, and sales organization. He led the design and the deployment at scale of security solutions for telecom, payment, identity, and access management. Nikolai is software engineer for Oracle. He has more than four years experience in Java, as well as being involved in different Java card and Internet of Things projects during his master's studies. At Oracle, he has been contributing to the implementation of solutions for the Java card platform and is an IoT and hardware security enthusiast. You will be able to ask questions uh, at the end of the presentation where we will open the microphones. And you can also uh, post question in the question window uh, of the webinar interface. And you can also focus uh, on the presentation. You will receive the slides tomorrow by email. And we will send um, a link to the slide uh, and post it on the Java Card Forum website. Patrick, Nikolai, the floor is yours. Thank you, John Daniel, and thanks everyone uh, for attending this webinar. So, uh, as you mentioned before, I'm Patrick Banaver, software engineer in the Java Platform Group at Oracle and spec lead for Java Card. And I'm presenting today together with my colleague uh, Nicolai, who also prepared a demo uh, for you. Um, today, we are going to talk about uh, device attestation and the implementation using uh, Java Card. So let me uh, switch to the agenda. So first, um, I will present the purpose of device attestation and how this is used specifically in the context of IoT. And then we will see how device attestation works uh, with details about the structure uh, of the attestations and about the execution flow. In the third part, uh, I will also explain how this can be implemented with the Java card, and we will have a demo. And then we will conclude with the benefits of using Java card uh, for device attestation. And uh, finally, after, as you said, we will open the Q&A session. OK, so let's start with the purpose of device attestations. So uh, device attestation is a mean to get a reliable or trustworthy evidence on characteristics and state of a device. So let me take some example. If, if we look at some IoT scenarios, we could think of an application uh, running on a server and looking for uh, the identifier uh, or the name of the manufacturer of a device to uniquely identify this device on, an, on the network. So the remote application on the server could also be interested in getting um, more details uh, about the device. 
So not only about the characteristic of it, but also some uh, dynamic or live information about the state of the device, uh, like making sure uh, the secure boot uh, completed successfully, uh, checking that the device is not running in debug mode, uh, checking the integrity of some software uh, on the device. And the remote application could also be interested in the version of some critical software uh, installed on the device and see, uh, for example, if, it's, uh, if the latest security patches have been deployed. Uh, it could also be interested in getting information about the location of the device. So these characteristics, uh, either static or dynamic, uh, are, are typically used by remote server to enforce a security policy. So, for example, during device onboarding, uh, the attestation can be used to detect rogue devices and uh, refuse their connection uh, to the network. Attestation can also be used uh, for remote monitoring of devices uh, to detect security issues. Uh, I mentioned the integrity of the software. Uh, or detect non-updated or compromised uh, some software, uh, detect abnormal behavior, and uh, consequently operate accordingly, so uh, deploy a patch, or limit the access, or limit the type of operation uh, this device can perform on the network. So the entity attestation tokens, are used to securely uh, transfer this information from the device to the, se the server application. So what I'm presenting today is based on some ongoing specification work. Uh, first at IETF uh, with the entity attestation token draft specification and also uh, at global platform uh, with the entity attestation protocol specification. So this one is referring to the IETF uh, draft, uh, but it's uh, adding some uh, specifics. So the requirements for this specification, uh, or I should say more the, um, the technical constraints, uh, were the following. So first, um, have some self-contained uh, data structures. So the idea is to make sure that the attestation remain independent from the communication protocol or from the authentication mechanism uh, used by the device uh, to connect to the network. Um, the goal is to be able to use these attestation tokens even uh, with constrained IoT devices or devices with different connectivity capabilities. And for example, not be limited to devices implementing a full HTTPS stack, but also work with devices using uh, other communication means, uh, could be co-op, MQTT, or any other one. So another important requirement is to be able to support an extensible list of claims, uh, and not only rely on, the, on a fixed uh, set uh, of claims or a static structure of the attestation, but allow some uh, other specs or external body to extend this spec and even extend it uh, at the applicative level. Also support uh, simple and compact encoding to have uh, efficient implementations with a small code size. Uh, support for integrity and confidentiality and also not be limited to a single signing or encryption scheme but be able to adapt uh, to uh, evolving crypto schemes or to uh, different device capabilities. So current specification uh, are based on existing uh, or well-known public specifications like uh, JSON uh, web tokens or CBOR web tokens. So CBOR stands for um, concise binary object representation. So it's a binary re representation of these JSON web tokens and also uh, COSI, so uh, CBOR object signing and encryption uh, for the security of these tokens.
So now let's have a look at how device attestation works. So here uh, we see the actors. So first, uh, the relying party. Uh, the relying party represents the server application uh, querying a device to get information from it. So the information is uh, the characteristics and the state uh, that I mentioned before. On the device side, uh, we have the attestation service. So the attestation service is the component that generates the attestation tokens uh, and digitally sign them. So it's important that this comes from a root of trust uh, within the device to enforce the authenticity of the claims embedded in the attestation token. So that's why here we have the attestation service uh, running within a secure element uh, in the device. And finally, we have the verification service, uh, which is an entity uh, capable of verifying the signature of the attestation tokens and prove uh, the authenticity. The verification service can either be executed as a separate and a remote service, like we have here, or be directly executed uh, as part of the relying party. So to make this work, we need some cryptographic keys. So here we are using uh, asymmetric cryptography and an attestation key pair. Uh, so the key pair is made of, of a private key and a public key. The private key needs to be uh, securely stored in the secure element and stay here. Uh, the public key needs to be accessible uh, by the verification service that will use it uh, to verify the attestation tokens. Uh, so there are multiple ways to achieve this. Uh, first, uh, the key pair uh, can be generated by uh, HSM. Uh, and then the key pair uh, can be uh, securely stored in the secure element, for example, during the manufacturing of the secure element or the manufacturing of the device. And the corresponding public key uh, needs to be stored, uh, for example, in a database together with the device unique identifier and will be used later by the verification service. Alternatively, um, the key pair can be generated by the secure element. So in this scenario, only the public key is extracted and exported uh, and may be stored in a database for the verification service. The private key uh, remains in the secure element. Uh, it's important to understand that this key provisioning uh, needs to be done before using the attestation service to create and sign uh, attestation tokens. But this does not mean that the key provisioning has to be done uh, at manufacturing. Uh, it may also be performed the first time the device is used or the first time at least the attestation service is used. Uh, also, the credentials uh, can be reprovisioned. Uh, for example, if you uh, attach an expiration date uh, to the key pair, or if the private key is compromised, uh, or if you want to perform a device refurbishment, uh, just to name a few uh, scenarios. So now uh, let's have a look at the execution flow. Uh, a typical exchange starts with an entity attestation token request uh, sent by the relaying party to the device. So here we assume that the communication channel is already established um, between the device and the server. Uh, this request that we see here uh, contains a list with uh, only the name of the characteristic the relying party is looking for. 
So for example, here we have the, uh, the identifier, device identifier, and security rating. And the value, uh, the corresponding values are empty uh, because they have to be filled by the attestation service running in the device. The request also contains uh, cryptographic nouns. So this is an arbitrary number, uh, which is modified at each request and used to prevent from replay attacks. So we will see in the next step how this is used. So then the device receives this attestation uh, request and it uh, forwards it to the attestation service. Uh, so here the request is forwarded to the secure element where the attestation service is running. The attestation service receives this request, uh, it decodes the structure uh, and prepares a response. So here we see the structure of an attestation token. So that's the response. So it's made of three parts. The first part is the header, which contains the algorithm used to sign the token. Uh, it could also contain a key identifier uh, that helped the verification service to know which uh, public key to use to verify the signature. Then we have a list of claims. Uh, so this is a list of uh, name value pairs where the names correspond to the one we receive in the request. So we find again, the, for example, here the device identifier and security uh, rating, and we see some values uh, provided by the attestation service. And finally, we have the signature uh, that ensures the integrity and authenticity of the attestation token. And the signature is computed using the private key uh, stored in the secure element. The, the token uh, structure uh, is uh, encoded using CBOR, or I should say COSI because we have the, the signature. Uh, so here we see again uh, the nonce, uh, the cryptographic nonce. Uh, that must match the value we receive in the request. So the nonce is included in the claims uh, and is signed. So we are sure that it cannot be modified, uh, or at least if it's modified, uh, the signature, uh, the verification of the signature will fail. So this ensures that the entity attestation token is a fresh response uh, to the previously received request. So it's not a pre-computed uh, token. It also protects again, uh, protect against uh, man-in-the-middle attacks where uh, someone could uh, intercept the messages, uh, drop the token uh, sent by the device, for example, and send back to the relying party a null token. So by verifying the nonce, the relying party will be able to detect that it's not receiving uh, a fresh response, but an old response. So um, then the attestation token is sent back to the relying party. So it's important uh, to note that the, both the request and the response are just Token. So by tokens, I mean a piece of data uh, that can be on, embedded and transported in any type of transport protocol. So it's fully independent from the type of communication established between the server and the device. So this allows uh, integration into uh, different uh, systems and architecture, no matter if it's uh, HTTPS over TCP uh, or co-op over UDP for more constrained device or any other protocol. So when receiving the response, the relying party needs to verify the, uh, the signature of the attestation token. And to do that, it sends a verification request uh, to the verification service. And also forward the token. And as said before, uh, the verification service can be implemented as a remote service or directly be uh, part of the relying party. So the verification service checks uh, the signature 
and is either accepting or rejecting the token. Then only after uh, verifying the signature, meaning that we, we check the integrity of the token, we can verify that the cryptographic nonce in the response uh, correspond to the nonce uh, in the request. And finally, the relying party can interpret the claims uh, and act accordingly. So the EAT uh, specification supports more complex scenarios. So for example, it supports uh, nested tokens coming from uh, multiple components uh, within the device. So we could, for example, have some sensitive information uh, that is only accessible to the secure element or to the attestation service running in the secure element. Uh, so the attestation service could uh, create an entity attestation token containing these claims, so here in blue, uh, sign it uh, using uh, the private key stored in the secure element, and send it back to the device application. So in addition, uh, the device application uh, can create another attestation token, so here in gray, uh, add its own claims, and embed the attestation uh, token received from the secure element uh, and sign it using its own key. So it's possible to create uh, multiple nested uh, attestation like this. So either even have more than two levels uh, or uh, have um, multiple uh, sub attestations uh, all at the same level, all embedded in, a, in another, another one. Also, uh, there are cases where we may want to ensure uh, data confidentiality or privacy. And this is achieved by uh, encrypting the token. And of course, uh, this needs to use a different algorithm and a different key than the one that were used for, for the signature. Okay, so now let's see uh, how to implement device attestation using Java Car. So here, you can see a block diagram of components uh, in the device. So running on the application processor, uh, here in gray, we have uh, first the device application, which is acting as a proxy. So on one end, it is using the device network stack uh, and managing the communication with the remote server, so with the relying party. And uh, on the other hand, it is using the entity attestation protocol uh, API to manage the communication with the attestation service. Uh, below that, we have the TPS client API. So this is a low level uh, API uh, managing the communication and IO interface uh, with the secure hardware hosting the attestation service. So in our case, it manages the communication with the secure elements, but you could have some other connectors to manage the communication with a trusted execution environment, for example, or other secure hardware. In the secure element, uh, first we have a Java Card platform uh, made of the Java Card runtime environment, uh, the Java Card virtual machine, and Java Card API. Uh, in the API, we are using the APDU uh, stack to communicate uh, with the, the host, uh, key storage to securely store the, the key pair, uh, digital signature, signature and encryption decryption. On top of that, we developed a library uh, that contains classes to encode and decode CBOR structures, sign uh, or encrypt attestation tokens, and an internal API used to access to uh, the values uh, used for the claims. And finally, uh, at the top, we have the attestation service, which is a Java card applet. Uh, it has two execution modes. So the first one uh, is used to perform the initial key provisioning. 
uh, store securely the, the private key uh, or, the, or generate the key pair, uh, manage the renewal of the keys if required. The other execution mode uh, is related to the, um, the process of entity attestation token requests uh, and to build uh, the tokens and the, the response. So here we see um, the architecture and setup for the demo. So first, uh, we have the relying party. Uh, for the relying party, we will use a web service uh, and it has its own web UI. Uh, in this UI, we will show um, the exchange performed uh, between the relying party and the device. So we will see the entity attestation token request on the left side, and also uh, the entity attestation token response received from the device. We also have the verification service uh, as a separate uh, service, but this has no UI. Uh, for the device part, uh, we have two implementations. So one, uh, one version which is fully simulated and executed on a laptop, and another version uh, running on a board. Uh, we use the ARM MuseCAD D1 test chip board. Uh, they both have the same uh, components with the device application, the attestation service running as a Java card application. Uh, and finally, we are using a console to show the communication uh, here between the client API uh, and the uh, Java card platform so, and the secure elements. So we will see the exchange uh, between these two components. For the board, as I mentioned, we use the uh, ARM uh, MUSCAD V1 test chip board. Uh, this board contains a uh, system on chip uh, which embeds two execution environments. So uh, one is uh, SSE uh, 200 subsystem. So this is a general purpose uh, runtime environment uh, with two, two Cortex M33 uh, processors, some system RAM and four megabytes of flash uh, storage. So this is where we are executing the device application uh, with the entity att attestation uh, protocol API and the communication stack. The second runtime environment is a secure enclave or an integrated secure element that has both uh, logical and phys physical security measures to protect against uh, attacks. Uh, so here we are using ARM Crypto Island uh, 300P, so P stands for the physical security. Uh, the secure enclave is used to perform security related tasks. So it contains its own uh, CPU, here it's a Cortex N0. It has uh, a mailbox to communicate with the application processor and some crypto accelerators also. So we ported the Java card platform to run in this uh, secure enclave with a virtual machine, a uh, complete runtime environment, and a Java card API. And this is using some firmware provided with uh, the crypto iron, uh, firmware for crypto, for messaging, uh, asset management, and so on. So, and finally, uh, we still have this uh, CBOR uh, EAT library uh, and on top the attestation service running as an applet. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to show you a video of the demo. Um, here uh, we see uh, and the claims that we used uh, for the demo. Uh, just, uh, I want to say a few things about this. So it's important to keep in mind that this is just a subset that we selected uh, based on the current uh, draft version of the spec. But um, 
the the the, the spec contains a much larger set of claims that you could use so that's one thing um, and also you can extend it uh, in your application one that i uh, didn't mention is uh, one of the claims for example is the mud file uh, where for example the, you could include uh, a link uh, to a server containing uh, uh, a file with the description of the of the device so that's typically one that uh, uh, could be used and that we didn't have time to include in this demo okay um, so now uh, let's recap and have a look at the key benefits of using java card to implement uh, device attestation so first of all uh, what is the dna of java card is that it's a secure a runtime environment so this means that uh, the attestation keys can be securely stored uh, and managed by the secure hardware but this also means that the entire attestation service uh, can be executed in the secure hardware so it's not like some other hardware based solution that can only run some uh, measurement or blindly sign uh, data created outside of the secure hardware here uh, all the steps are performed uh, entirely by the secure service uh, running in the secure element. So passing the attestation token request, retrieving the values for the claim, uh, building the attestation tokens, uh, and signing it. So by running uh, the attestation service uh, with Java Card, we significantly improve the security because uh, when the token goes out of the secure element, it's complete and uh, it's sealed so uh, and it's not modified anymore another uh, fundamental characteristics compared to other solutions is the portability um, we've all heard about these growing numbers of billions of connected devices expected in the next next five years but an important challenge for service provider is uh, to handle the hardware fragmentation including the fragmentation uh, at the uh, hardware security level uh, and the key characteristic uh, of java card is the abstraction of the underlying hardware so this allows a seamless deployment of the attestation service on different hardware uh, and different form factors so for example in the demo uh, we use the exact same uh, attestation service uh, both on the simulated environment running on a PC or uh, in an integrated secure element which was part of uh, SOC and this didn't require any change uh, neither in the attestation service nor in the device application uh, nor in the server-side application and uh, without changing anything we could even have uh, replicated this demo uh, on another type of uh, secure hardware on an embedded secure element meaning a separate secure chip uh, soldered in the device another benefit is the adaptability and extensibility so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the specifications are still work in progress uh, and there are multiple initiatives to define uh, attestation schemes. So it's likely, uh, at least at the beginning, that you will have to support uh, multiple and slightly different attestation schemes, either to connect to different cloud providers or to use services from different vendors it may also happen that you would like to extend the attestation service so beyond the list of claims already listed in the spec uh, in order to include uh, claims uh, relevant or critical to your service and that are only relevant i would say in the context of your application so by implementing the attestation service using java card you can easily uh, extend or adapt uh, its implementation and redeploy it so redeployment uh, brings us to the fourth point which is uh, manageability 
So in addition to the fragmentation issue that I already mentioned, another challenge in the IoT landscape is how fast the architectures, the reference design, the specifications, the regulations are evolving. And evolving the attestation scheme, uh, repurposing a device, migrating from one cloud provider to another, uh, uh, deploying security patches, uh, updating the security protocol, uh, updating uh, the crypto algorithm that you are using to keep uh, a state-of-the-art security level. So all these scenarios uh, require to be able to um, manage, uh, update or upgrade the attestation service. And that's exactly what uh, JavaCard is about uh, and what JavaCard allows you to do. Uh, manage, update and upgrade uh, your service. So to conclude, um, JavaCard offers a secure uh, runtime, able to host a complete attestation service and able to generate a complete and reliable uh, attestation tokens. It also uh, simplifies the handling of different hardware architectures and reduces the associated deployment and maintenance costs. It also offers an extensible and manageable uh, solution to implement device attestation and to build your IoT device security. So that's all uh, for the presentation for today. And uh, we can now take your questions, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for the presentation. Um, we had a few questions on the chat. Um, uh, quite a few of them from uh, Hannes. Uh, Hannes, would you like to uh, ask your question directly? If not, I will read them. Okay, so we have a first question from uh, Hannes Stephanie, which is uh, on the availability of um, uh, these uh, features, uh, is, is it uh, public? So uh, it depends on what we are talking about. So regarding the specifications, uh, the, the specifications are, as I said, work in progress. Uh, so the EATF specs are public, the global platform uh, not yet. Uh, regarding the the code, um, so uh, for now, no, it's it was just uh, developed for uh, for demo. Uh, so it's an internal development just for demo and uh, present this use case. Okay, another one is uh, on the claims. Uh, what what claims are you using in the EAT? Um, so I think I, I had a slide with the list of claims that we use for the demo. Uh, so we use, uh, I don't remember, six or seven of them, but so it just, it's really an, uh, a demo. It's an example of claims. I think um, it makes sense to go in the spec and pick exactly the one that are relevant, uh, depending on the use case you want to, to, to demonstrate. Um, the important ones are, of course, the nonce and probably the user identifier. I mentioned also the MUD file, which is typically useful, uh, used to get some information about the device, like the manufacturer, some serial number, and things like that. But um, also, there are some interesting uh, claims that could be used uh, more uh, related to the current um, current status of the device. So it's not static information that is always the same, but regularly you might want to send some requests to get information about the, uh, the version of the software deployed or the, the integrity of the software on the device, for example. Okay. Then we have a question on the, um, the constraint or the requirement it has in terms of uh, kilobytes or Flash memory uh, to implement this full software stack and especially the 
keyboard parsing and the attestation uh, functionality. Mm. So, uh, so for the Java card, VM, uh, and API, so uh, I, I, yeah, what you need to keep in mind is so I don't want to go too much into detail because I think there are um, many implementers uh, out there that each have its own implementation and the level of security may vary a lot also. Uh, but typically, it's still uh, it's small numbers, like uh, I would say between. Uh, uh, less than 100k to uh, maybe 200k sometimes one key point is it depends um, also if the platform is uh, for example just embedding uh, the entity attestation token service uh, and is closed version of java account that does not support additional applications but if you want to uh, be able to upgrade and update you need a full runtime and in this case probably it's a it's a bit uh, bigger bigger number for RAM consumption usually it's it's very small it's a few kilobytes uh, and the yeah the applet and the, the so the attestation service and the Cibor library are very small it's a few kilobytes okay thank you um, another one on uh, where this is uh, located is it the Java card applet and is it part of the underlying services? I guess the, the runtime and so is it something mm -hmm. as part of the platform or, or not? Yeah, so so today um, it's fully implemented as an applet and the library, a, a pure Java card library. So the, uh, it of course it's 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 based on the Java card API. Uh, but it's not part uh, of the um, of the platform, right? It's just uh, an extension of the platform developed as an applet and as a library. Uh, for the the CBOR parsing, it has no specific requirement uh, from the API. It's very standard uh, Java or Java card uh, code. Um, for the tokens and specifically for the signing uh, or the encryption, of course, this rely on the crypto API of Java card. Uh, so, for example, in the demo, we used uh, ECDSA, uh, so elliptic curves. Uh, so the platform needs to support that. I think it's available in most of the version of Java Card. Uh, with the latest version of Java Card, Java Card 3.1, uh, there, there is also um, an API to create some named curves, which allows to reduce even more the size of the attestation service. Because you don't have to configure the domain parameters of the curve. Okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, if you do so, please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask directly, uh, Patrick. No other questions? Okay. Okay, I guess not. Um, once again, uh, thank you, Patrick, for this uh, great presentation, and thank you to the audience for uh, participating. And uh, you will receive the slides uh, or links to the slides uh, in your mail tomorrow and links on the Java Card forum. And you will be able to also see the, the replay. Thank you for attendance and stay tuned for our latest webinar in the series next week, also with a demonstration for Oracle. So have a good day or good evening, everybody, and thanks for attending. Thanks a lot.